Now we're carrying on with our series of videos looking at the body cavities. Now so far we've noticed that there's the pelvic cavity here in yellow and the abdominal cavity and together these can be described as the abdominopelvic cavity. And above this we have the thoracic uh, cavity, the chest cavity. Now these are called the anterior cavities because they're at the front or they're also sometimes called the ventral cavities because this is the ventral surface of the body. So these are ventral cavities. But we also notice that there's cavities at the back and we notice that there's the cranial cavity continuous with the vertebral uh, cavity going down here housing the spinal cord so the brain is in the cranial cavity the spinal cord and the large spinal nerves in the vertebral or spinal cavity and this surface of the body is posterior and that's known as the dorsal surface of the body so this is ventral this is dorsal at the back so these are known as the dorsal cavities as opposed to the ventral cavities at the front. So thorax, abdominal, pelvic, ventral, cranial, spinal cavity, dorsal. <laughs> now I know it's a bit confusing because that, that bit there is actually at the front, but, but nevertheless these are classified as dorsal or, or posterior cavities. And we notice that these are, are continuous, that the uh, cranial cavity, surrounded by the cranial bones, is continuous with the vertebral cavity surrounded by the bony vertebrae so it forms a continuous cavity and we want to look at the way this cavity is subdivided but first of all and what we want to do for all of these cavities is look at the membranes that are associated with the particular body cavity and the membranes in the uh, cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity are the meninges the meninges and what we'll see is there's three meningeal layers the dura mater the arachnoid mater and the pia mater these are the three <coughs> meningeal layers collectively these form the meninges and mater is an old word it's a latin word really it means mother so, so the meninges are described as the mother of the brain, although we know it contains, surrounds the entire uh, central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, mater would be mother, pater would be father. So uh, the mother of the brain, quite a, a poetic way to, to look at it, really. Named by old anatomists, and we've just kept the name. So dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater, the meninges. Right, let's look at these now and, and how they're arranged. And already you might be interested in this because you've probably heard of meningitis, life-threatening condition, which is infection of these uh, meningeal layers, or, or to be more precise, inflammation of the meningeal layers. Now, um, let's imagine here we have the uh, here we have the bone of the skull. So that's the bone of the skull there. Or, or it could be the bone of the vertebrae, but let's imagine we're looking at the meninges, the meninges in the head. So we're looking at one of these cranial bones. That's good. Nice thick bone to protect the delicate underlying neurological structures. Because down here, within the skull, a little further down, we have the, the surface of the brain. Now the brain rises in gyri and sinks into a sulci. So it's upper gyrus, down a sulcus, gyri and sulci. That's the way that the brain is organised, the, uh, the, the, the surface of the brain. And this outer part of the brain is the cerebral cortex. The cortex being the outer part of the organ. This is the cerebral cortex. And really, it's the cerebral cortex that makes us human. A lot of, a lot of higher functioning it goes on here in the in the outer part of the cerebrum so underneath here this is all cerebrum this is the outer part of the cerebrum so it's the cerebral cortex the outer part now to get on to the uh, interesting uh, meninges now surrounding the underside of the skull there's a thick layer of fibrous tissue 
And this is the first of the meningeal layers, nice, thick, protective tissue. And this is the duomater, the duomater. There. And then um, lining the surface of the brain itself, or if this was at the spinal level, lining the surface of the spinal cord, we have a thin, delicate layer here lining the surface of the brain, going down the sulci, up the gyri, down the sulcus. And this is the piamater. So this is the piamater. So we could maybe just write that on to remind ourselves. So it's dura in green. Dura mater in green and uh, pia mater in blue. Right. Now, immediately under the um, immediately under the dura is the layer called the arachnoid mater. Arachnoid, an arachnoid's a spider, isn't it? So when anatomists first looked at this, they thought, oh, this layer looks web-like. Uh, and it does. So we'll call it a, <coughs> a spider-like membrane, the arachnoid mater. So this is the arachnoid. The arachnoid mater. Now, the thing about the arachnoid mater is um, it's kind of a three-dimensional layer, really, because there's strands of it go down from the main part of the arachnoid there down to the uh, connecting with the pia mater there like that. So that's when you peel it off. It looks like web-like because there's all these little bits in it here. And the key thing about this layer is underneath the arachnoid mater, there's an, a subarachnoid space. So sub means below. So there's a space here below the arachnoid mater. This is absolutely critical because this space is filled with the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF. The cerebrospinal fluid. And this is vital because what it means is the brain is essentially floating. Because this cerebrospinal fluid, of course, it goes all around the cranium, down the spinal cord. So the central nervous system is essentially floating in this cerebrospinal fluid. Absolutely vital shock absorber. It's been said that if we didn't have the cerebrospinal fluid to cushion the brain, that stepping off the curb would be enough to bash the brain on the inside of our skulls and potentially knock us out. So without the cerebrospinal fluid, we'd be unconscious a lot of the time, which would be well, you know, inconvenient, to put it mildly. <laughs> um, so, so this is the arrangement of the of the meninges, and these go round the brain and they go continuously down the spinal cord. So really, if we look at the, uh, the, the shape of this all together, the shape of the meninges all together, we're going to have the, uh, the cranial part here like this. And then they're going to go down the vertebral canal like this. So they're going to be shaped like that. And of course, underneath there, there's going to be the, uh, the arachnoid. Again, all the way, all the way around. Then beneath that, the cerebrospinal fluid. So you can see that the whole central nervous system is, is floating essentially in this, in this um, cerebrospinal fluid. So absolutely uh, fascinating and uh, vital arrangement of, of the, uh, the meningeal layers. And we've said that in meningitis, the meningeal layers become uh, inflamed and painful. So that's one reason these people get a stiff neck because of course the, the meninges is, is going through the neck. And so the neck is going to be stiff because when you move your neck, you're actually moving and stretching your meningeal layers to some extent. And if they're inflamed and painful, you're not going to want to do that. And these patients will have a, a stiff neck. It'll be stiff because the muscles of the neck are going to guard. They're going to become uh, toned and somewhat rigid to guard the painful underlying 
underlying tissues of the meninges. So that's one point I wanted to cover in this video. Now the other part I wanted to do as well as the, the coverings that, that are associated with the, the, uh, the brain and the, the, the cranial and the vertebral cavities. Um, I wanted to look at the way the, um, the cranial cavity is, is subdivided. So um, let's imagine, um, well, the, the, the brain, of course, is, is somewhat, like a, somewhat like a boxing glove. So, so here, we have the, uh, here we have the brain, like this. So that, that's roughly the brain. So we notice that we have uh, we notice that we have frontal lobes here. These are the frontal lobes. Frontal lobes, occipital lobe at the back. Just here, where we see with uh, temporal lobe just here, and this is the parietal lobe uh, here. And these form the uh, the cerebrum. This is the cerebrum. So this top part is the cerebrum. The cerebrum of the brain. Remember we said the outer part was the cerebral cortex. So frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal lobes. Good. Now... At the front of the brain, towards the front of the brain, we also have the uh, we also have the brain stem just here. So here we have the brain stem, and the brain stem is divided into three parts: the uh, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, and a lot of vital autonomic functioning goes on in the brain stem, controlling vital activities like breathing, for example. And then just behind that, there's another area here which is shaped a bit like a cauliflower. And this is the cerebellum. So we have the uh, brain stem and we have the cerebellum. So it's cerebrum and cerebellum. Now, what's interesting about this is that the meningeal layers actually go around about here right, as we know so here we for example we have the dura mater which we drew in green and that's going to go down here and then of course this lower part of the brain stem is continuous with the spinal cord so this would be spinal cord here continuous with the brain stem so the Meninges are going to follow this round like this. There we go. So the dura mater is going around, and, and of course we would have the associated arachnoid mater and pia mater and the cerebrospinal fluid. But the cranial cavity is also so all of this here is going to be cranial cavity. So if, if we drew the bones of the skull here, the bones of the skull would be at this level here like this. These would be the cranial bones at, at this level would be here. Like this, going round about the, round about the brain to protect it, round about the skull. That would be the skull going around there. So that's the skull. Now, the, the, the gap at the base here is the uh, foramen magnum. <laughs> so that's the foramen magnum there. So what we see is we have quite a lot of brain tissue within the cranial cavity. And this isn't ideal because the brain has, has a mass and it will, it will move. We'll get movement of the brain. So ideally what we want is something to support the brain, to... To, to, to hold the various parts of the brain. And this is exactly what happens. Because there's an infold of the dura mater at the level of the uh, occipital bone there, in fact, coming from the occipital bone. And this layer of the dura mater goes in the way like this. And it actually goes round about the, uh, the sides of the brainstem as well. 
and uh, this bit that goes in is called the uh, tentorium or the tentorium cerebelli. And what this does is it, it's it's supporting the, the upper part of the brain. So so this lower part here is like supporting the weight of the upper part of the brain. Um, it's a bit like a bra, really. It supports and separates. So that means we have two components or two areas within the cranial cavity. We have this upper area here, which is called the supratentorial area, above the tentorial membrane. And we have this other area here, which is below the tentorial membrane. And this is called the uh, infratentorial uh, area. And this is important to know about because if there's an increase in the intracranial pressure, for example, if you've got a blood clot up here or something, if there's a, if there's a space occupying lesion, such as a hematoma that's putting pressure on the brain, that can make part of the, part of the uh, brain, can force part of the brain down through the membrane like that. It's called a herniation. And part of the... Uh, part of the temporal lobe, uh, part of the temporal lobe, often called the uncus of the temporal lobe, is pushed through into the infratentorial space. And of course, that starts pressure, pressure on the cerebellum and the brainstem, and the brainstem has all these vital functions going on. So that's really quite a bad idea. So just to look at this in a, in a sort of a, a simplified way, just to make sure we've got it. So, so what we've said here, is that we have the, the 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 brain is shaped like a boxing glove like that so that's the brain there like that the cerebrum then we have the brain stem and we have the cerebellum and the spinal cord and the dura mater folds in and there's the dura going round but there's an infold of the dura just here called the tentorium supporting and separating the supratentorial cavity from the infratentorial cavity. There's also another infold of the dura mater on the top called the falx cerebri that separates the two uh, hemispheres. So you have the right cerebral hemisphere, the left cerebral hemisphere, and they're, they're um, separated by the falx cerebri as well. So to some extent we have the, 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 right, the, the right part of the cranial cavity and the left part of the cranial cavity. But what we normally talk about is the supratentorial compartment and the infratentorial compartment. So we see there's two compartments to the cranial cavity, supratentorial and infratentorial. So in this video we've looked at the, uh, the meninges surrounding the, the brain and the spinal cord. And we've looked at the way the cranial cavity is subdivided into the supra and infratentorial compartments. So in the next one, we'll look at the uh, thoracic cavity.